I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never ever die. Welcome back, New Story Church. Welcome to week three of our I Am series. For those of you who are joining us, we are doing a seven-week run up to Easter as we are looking at who Jesus says he is and we're engaging and having conversations with Jesus, asking this question, Jesus, who are you? And then creating space for him to respond. Uh, My name is Blake, as Pastor Tom said. I'm the college pastor here, which basically means I have the best job in the entire church. I just take students out for like fast food and coffee every day. Really, like there is no better job than this. Um, So when I was asked to be part of the rotation for this sermon series, I got really excited because I have been very blessed for the last two weeks, especially for this time when we come to the sermon and we start to look at who Jesus says he is from the Gospel of John. And so I'm very excited. I've been very blessed the last two weeks. Hopefully Jesus will show up and we will have a third week where Jesus comes through. Um, first, though, I want to take a moment to take stock of where we are in the world, where we are as a church, as a community. Um, there's a lot of things that are broken about this week. There are a lot of things that are wrong about the world this week. And I think it's very timely that God would put us having a conversation about death and life in the week that the world is really focusing and noticing how precious and how fragile human life really is. So my goal today is that we would have a very sensitive but a very meaningful conversation about what it means to engage with God about questions about death and life. I do love that we are a church marked by prayer, and I love that we are a church that makes space to pray for our brothers and sisters across the world, and that we would again pray for God's justice, that we would pray for God's healing, and that he would come into the brokenness that we're experiencing this week in Christ Church in New Zealand. But I also have to ask for us as a community here, what does this mean for us? What do we do when we experience this level of brokenness or this level of evil, I would say? What do we do when our experience of the world doesn't match up with maybe our view of who God is? I recently spoke with a student over coffee, um, trying to harmonize all of the hatred and all of the violence that we are seeing in the world and bringing about like God is a good and wonderful creator who's bringing everything new and to himself. Because a lot of times they don't seem to match up. A lot of times we find ourselves asking, God, where are you? Why don't you show up? What about those prayers that we prayed over the last shooting? Why don't you intervene? Why don't you work a miracle? We we know that you answer prayers and we know that, or we believe that you still do miracles today. Why don't you do something now? Or maybe a little closer to home. A week ago on Sunday, my wife and I were driving here. We live in the neighborhood and we came across this police tape that was sectioning off this whole block in a neighborhood. And we're like, wow, what an inconvenience on our way to church. We got to take the long way around come to find out that a a USC student was robbed and gunned down two blocks from my house. He was a musician. He had a bright future. God, why don't you intervene in moments like these? 
Our perspective of God, of who God is and what we expect from him doesn't always play out like we pray. And I think many of us can put ourselves in that position where we pray for God, we pray for God to move or to intervene or to do something in our lives, but we don't hear anything. And so we see the brokenness and the reality of the world is that what we see doesn't match up with what we believe. And so we do the good Christian thing and we pray. We pray that God would heal my body. That's not how you spell body. There you go. That you would heal my body. The memories and the scars of my past are starting to come back and my body is breaking down. Or maybe you're a parent. And honestly, you're asking that God would do something with my child who's walked away. And I don't know what my son or my daughter is going to do with their life. And I don't know if they know what they're going to do with their life, but they seem to be spiraling. For some parents, my child is in chronic pain. My, my child doesn't deserve the pain that they experience day in and day out, and there's nothing that I can do to relieve them from that. Or maybe something that's not so heavy. Maybe just a job. God, I have been at the same job, working tirelessly, putting in the overtime, trying to make sense of why I do this. God, why don't you intervene? Why don't you show up? I believe that you have the power to do this, but all I'm getting is silence. And the one that seems to be coming up the most in our congregation right now is cancer. And when I look at the world and I look at my own life, the perspective I have doesn't match up with what I believe. Because so often I bring my prayers, my petitions, my, my, my heart's desires on what God would do with these things. And we wait. And I think we actually move to a very sacred place where we come with expectation. We come with silence. We wait for God to do a miracle. We wait for God to move to do something. And this morning I want to preach out of my own life. I have known about this topic for a couple weeks now and I want to share with you what God has been doing in my story. And I feel like it is important for me to lead out of transparency. It was a year ago today, uh, a year ago to the week, actually, that my brother-in-law, Danny, um, went to the hospital because he had some stomach pain. There was a flu going around. And my brother-in-law, he ran the paramedic department in the very hospital in my hometown. And so he thought it was pretty routine, just go in, get a checkup, get antibiotics, do the work. But once he was there with the doctor, they did an intake and some things didn't seem to match up. So they started to do more tests and it looked like pancreatitis, but that didn't match up. And the more they looked, the more they found. My sister Amanda would call and give us updates and we were added to the prayer list. They found lesions on the liver and we prayed. They discovered lesions throughout the digestive tract. We prayed. They found a cancerous mass in Danny's esophagus. And it was too advanced and too far gone to operate. And so we prayed. By the 1st of April, Danny was diagnosed one to two years left to live. It was the most life-changing thing my family and I have ever gone through. What do you do when you have a healthy 42-year-old man with two kids? He gets that kind of news. You pray. 
We prayed for healing. We prayed over doctor's appointments. We prayed knowing that God had the power to work a miracle. We prayed when chemo started. We prayed for those two little boys who couldn't wrap their minds around their father's sickness. With each round of bad news, things seemed to just get worse and worse. And all I heard from Jesus was silence. But we prayed that God would do a miracle. And the miracle kept being put off. And I asked Jesus, why do you delay? I know you can do something. Why don't you do something now? And my unanswered prayers seemed to just pile up. And the view I had of the world did not match up with the belief that I had in God. Looking back at everything, it seemed like we were alone. And I caught myself asking the question, God, why weren't you here? Jesus, why don't you show up and bring healing or a miracle or something? It would be an incredible testimony to my family for you to show up now. Why weren't you here? This morning, my prayer is that we, in a very sensitive and meaningful way, have a conversation about what we do when Jesus disappoints us. I want to be tactful. I want to be prayerful. But I want to have that open, sacred space to say, what do we do when we have unmet expectations or unanswered prayers? What do we do with that? For this whole series, we are in John's biography, and we are looking at the seven I am statements of Jesus. Today, we are going to be in John chapter 11. Um, So please turn onto your phone or in your Bible. We're going to be in chapter 11. If you don't have it, uh, the U version on your phone, we're going to have the text behind me. And we're going to engage with others who had similar questions of Jesus. Now, a certain man was ill. Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped her his feet with her own hair. It was this Mary whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to Jesus saying, "Lord, he whom you love is ill." And I love this. They don't have to say his name like your friend who you love so much is ill. Why don't you come? But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Jesus says here that this sickness, this illness, does not lead to Lazarus' death, which is great. But the reason that he gives for that is so that this could be for God's glory. Jesus is wanting to do something even greater than what Mary and Martha could see. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he dropped what he was doing and he rushed back to save them. No. He stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus find themselves waiting on Jesus. And yet he does not come. Not yet. Jesus delays his coming for two more days. And if the idea of Jesus not rushing and coming to his friend's aid bothers you, I want you to know you're not the only one. What benefit is it to be Jesus' friend, the miracle worker, the healer of the world? He seems to make time for every other person's problems except his friends who he loves. What gives? Let's skip to verse 11. After saying these things to his disciples, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. Is this true? Is Lazarus asleep? Why does Jesus use this word uh, for what Lazarus is going through, with Lazarus' own death? Is he trying to be sensitive is he trying to use a euphemism? Are there kids around that he's trying to like protect them? Why does Jesus talk about death 
like it is someone who is sleeping. Maybe it's to allude to his own power of what it means for him to come alongside death. Or maybe it's alluding to what will happen in this story. Some of you grew up in church and you know that this story has a happy ending. Or maybe he is trying to lay another piece of the perspective in place so that his people will understand what death and life really means. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may, what church? Believe. But let us go to him. I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. Believe in what? Believe in who? It's important to know where this falls in Jesus' timeline. This is the last event. This is the last miracle of Jesus' ministry. This is to the end of John's uh, ministry account of where Jesus is going before he goes to the cross. And just the chapter before, we have one of my favorite lines in all of scripture. The Jews, after three years of peppering Jesus with questions, they lose their mind. They finally come to him and they say, Jesus... Will you stop playing with us? Will you speak plainly and tell us if you are the Christ? 1024, I'm paraphrasing. But they say, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. You say I am blaspheming because I say that I am the son of God. But if I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do the works of God, and you see that my actions match up with my claims, then you must believe me. Jesus gives the disciples, he gives us a measuring stick in, a measuring stick in which we can measure Jesus himself. That we can actually measure the claims of Jesus. He says, Don't just look at my words. Look at the actions of my life. And if those two match up, then believe. Jesus brings the disciples to this point so that he can say, come. Come, see, and believe. The faith that you have in me is not a blind kind of faith. Come, see, and believe. Don't just judge me based on my words. Come and see for yourself that what I say is true. So Thomas, called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Believing that by going to Lazarus, Lazarus, they were actually giving themselves into the hands of the Jews who wanted to kill them. Verse 20. Let us go. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Martha comes to Jesus with her unmet expectations, with her unanswered prayers, and she asks the big question, our question today, why weren't you here? If you had been here, my brother would still be alive. Danny had been married to my sister for almost 20 years. Uh, He was there from when I was super young, and I can barely remember a time when Danny was not part of my life. So when I heard one to two years, I was devastated. My whole family was. There weren't any words to convey what we felt. At first, it barely seemed real. How could this happen? He found out on a Saturday and then three days later began an aggressive form of chemotherapy. He did seven rounds of chemo and each time he would have it hooked up to him for five days. Five days on, five days off. Five days on, five days off. 
he started losing his health even faster than anyone had expected. He was in constant pain and the medication was just never enough to give him relief. Danny declined rapidly and everything started shutting down. My sister Amanda asked for prayers when she knew that they couldn't go on like this anymore. She asked for strength to have the hard conversation. Danny was immovable at this point, and so Amanda sat down at his feet and had the conversation about ending treatment. They both agreed on September 2nd that they would move to hospice care, and that they were done fighting. A few days later, I received a text from one of my other sisters that I needed to catch the next flight out of L.A. It was time. It was the longest red-eye flight of my life. I made it to the hospital in the morning, and by the evening, Danny was starting to struggle with breathing. So Amanda and their boys crawled into his bed to say their last goodbyes. But even now, Lord, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus tenderly speaks the truth to her, and he says, your brother will rise again. Martha, almost feeling like this was a a cheap answer from Jesus, responds to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus corrects her, no, you, you don't understand. You perceive the resurrection as just a time and as a place so much so that you miss the person who makes that happen. I am the resurrection and I am the life. Heaven is not glorious without me. There is no resurrection, there is no hope without me. Without me, the hope of a future heaven is lost. You are so looking for a place that you miss the person. Jesus is not keeping Lazarus from physical death, no. Lazarus is like all humans. It is an inevitable end for all of us. What Jesus is saying is that God's promise is that the soul will live on in heaven even though the body expires. That even though our time on earth comes to an end, there will be a hope, there will be a future, there will be a life after this. And whoever believes in me Though he die, he shall have that life. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Believe in me. Jesus says, do you believe this? Martha said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. Martha does something incredible here. She takes all of the unmet expectations, all of the disappointments, all of the unanswered prayers, and she brings them to Jesus. Not for what he will do with them, because honestly, after death, there are no expectations. After death, there can be no more prayers. There's nothing else after death. And she brings those broken parts of her life, and she brings them to Jesus. And she turns it into belief that Jesus can do something even though we can't see it. That doesn't mean that she doesn't have hope for healing. That doesn't mean that she gave up all her hopes for a miracle. It means that she was willing to put her faith in Jesus doing something that she didn't understand. I spoke with my sister in the last couple weeks to ask her permission to share these stories. These are her and Danny's stories. And she said, if my husband's death doesn't give anyone else purpose, then his death doesn't mean anything. And she reminded me that sometimes you have to wait to see what God wants to do. Even if you can't see it yet. That is where we meet Jesus this morning. The invitation from Jesus is that we would have our eyes open to see what God would do with brokenness. 
and that we wouldn't come with closed expectation, but with open eyes to really see something miraculous. And when we do, we discover that belief is not blind. But in a way, come, see, and believe. And it is through believing in Jesus that we access eternal life. Our question to Jesus is, why weren't you here? And Jesus responds with, do you believe? Do you believe in me? Not just in what I can do. And that is where I think Jesus does the first of two things for us this morning. He sees our expectations, our unmet prayers. And he does one of the kindest things that he could ever do for us. He lets them shatter. And then he comes to us with a new expectation and a new perspective. And he says, look at what your expectations bring you. But what if I were part of the equation? What if I were bringing something new and a new perspective that was bigger than all of your expectations? What if I want to do something truly miraculous? He says, I am the resurrection. I am the hope and the future and the heaven that you've been praying for. He offers hope even when there are unmet expectations from God. He is there even when there are unanswered prayers of him. Hmm. Uh, My wife and I, we live with another family. They're a ministry couple, and they have three little kids. They have a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old. And it was two weeks ago, we were watching a movie with them, and they had to pause the movie because it got to a really scary part in the movie. And they explained to us that whenever they're watching a movie with their kids and it starts to get dark, it starts to get scary, they have to pause it and sit down with the kids and say, in the end, the hero wins. And they give spoilers to all their kids. And they're like, well, this actually happens. These two end up together. And the kids get to know all the stuff that happens at the end of the movie. And it is only after they explain to them that the hero wins and that the story turns out okay, that they can turn the movie back on and they can see that the scary parts now don't seem so scary and that the dark parts of the movie now don't seem as bleak. It is this understanding that the hero wins and the victory is ours and the story ends well that helps you see broken things not to be so broken and scary parts to not be so scary. After Danny passed, there was a moment in the hospital room where all of us, the family, and a few of the friends were standing around on the walls and we were just crying. And a couple of high school friends uh, who were there to support Cole, my oldest nephew, They were there and they were just weeping and this was their first experience with death up close. And none of them were Christians. And my sister, in a moment of incredible strength and incredible clarity, crawls out of bed and she turns to them and she says, do you know why this is okay? Do you know why I can be okay with this in this moment? She says, because I know where my husband is. My husband is no longer that man in the bed. My husband is that man in heaven. And she says, you need to know that there is hope even in this. The hero wins and the story turns out well. You need to know. You need to know that we win in the end. And that Jesus comes with something greater than our own desires. He comes to meet our need for more than just a healing, a miracle worker, a a healed body, a new job, a restored child. He meets our need for a savior. And it is after meeting our need for a savior that we can understand with a new perspective what he is trying to do in our lives. He is bringing a perspective of life even after death. He is bringing a perspective of hope even amidst tragedy. 
And honestly, I think he's also bringing more than just a perspective. I think he's bringing a relationship. He's bringing a community. Verse 32. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him the same thing, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said to her, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Unlike his interaction with Martha, Jesus meets Mary where she is at. He doesn't give her any talk of resurrection. He doesn't give her any talk of a life after this. He sits there and he mourns and he weeps and he cries and he fully embraces the hardship that she is in. There is deep compassion here in the art of being with someone in their pain. Now, I believe Jesus actually does a second incredible thing here. Beyond giving a perspective on resurrection, he gives a perspective on relationship. Jesus offers himself in relationship. He is with you. Even with the perspective of eternal life being made accessible through Jesus, Jesus still says, I am sitting here with you in your darkest moments. And honestly, some of you in this very warm tent need to know that Jesus is with you in those moments. And that the families that lost loved ones in New Zealand, Jesus is with them in those moments. And for the students who are mourning the loss of a friend, Jesus is with you in those moments. And the hard times that you will have with loved ones, with loss, with tragedy, Jesus is with you in those moments. Some of you just need to know that this morning. And even though he claimed himself as a resurrection and the life, he said it was okay to mourn the unnatural thing we call death. Death is the ultimate brokenness of our broken world. It's a symbol that things aren't made right. And that's not how Jesus wants things to end. Verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be quite an odor for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So he took away the stone and Jesus lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around me that they may, what church? Believe. Believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out with his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. This resurrection is the climax. This is the centerpiece of John's gospel. He says, this is the last piece that needs to be put in place so that you can see what Jesus is about to do on the cross. I have heard that this was the most amazing miracle of all. It shows Jesus' power even over death. Because of this account, the last puzzle piece is in play. Now we can truly see resurrection for what it is. It's a person. And that, I think, is what the true miracle today really is. The true miracle is the promise of life, even in the middle of tragedy and pain. Lazarus was human. He was a man who would once again experience death, maybe in his old age, maybe way later. But he would again experience death. The real miracle is not that a man raised from the dead. It was the fact that none of us would ever have to go into death with fear again. 
That's why we practice baptism. That's why we celebrate the symbolic act of being buried in the water and being brought back as a new living being in Christ. It's an expression of us being brought to new life in Christ. Ephesians 2 puts it this way, that you once were dead in your sin, but now you are alive. And that's the kind of truth today that we need. This kind of life comes from believing in Jesus and Jesus alone. That is our main truth that we can hold on today, that true life comes from believing in Jesus. The kind of life that comes from a hope beyond even death and living that hope now. That only comes from releasing our expectations, letting go of what we want from Jesus, and being open to Jesus doing something that we can't even imagine. Taking a new perspective and embracing that he is with us when we move from our unanswered prayers and our unmet expectations and we bring them to a belief in Jesus. This is good news. We are getting ready to move into an extended response time. The worship team can start making their way up. But I want us to come to Jesus with these questions in mind. Being very self-aware. Asking the question of ourselves, what expectations do I have of Jesus? What unanswered prayers, what unmet expectations do I bring to Jesus? And then the next question, do those expectations get in the way of who Jesus really is? The band is going to play some music to create a sacred space for us to have this conversation with Jesus. Each of you, when you came in, in your bulletin, you should have received a uh, circle mirror, a round mirror. This, sorry, Joe. Joe. Um, this is a reminder that we come with expectations every day. Not these expectations are wrong, not that these prayers are wrong, not that our hurts and our hangups are wrong, but the expectation that we have is that if Jesus doesn't heal this, is Jesus any less who he says he is? So in these next two songs, my prayer is that we would take time to give those expectations to a belief in Jesus.